I feel like I have an opportunity to have an impact in uh, my country's history. Finding peace with your past is probably very important, and I feel like Russia, Russia has been able to do it. In that game, it's depicted as if the Russians are bombing it. So they are literally re reversing the roles. I mean... So you played in the, the, the Wagner headquarters? Yeah, well, PMC Wagner Center as it is. I'll show it on screen. I'll show it on screen. Yeah, yeah. sure. When they were promised uh, anti-air support in Syria, but uh, it wasn't provided and it resulted in uh, mm. deaths of uh, Wagner fighters. I was very lucky to leave 30 minutes before the bombing itself. It's crazy. I am. I feel like I'm more known in China than I am throughout all my career here. And, and my friend, some time ago, I did a poll on Instagram whether to interview or not Grisha, the famous 17-year-old streamer that played in the Wagner Tower in St. Petersburg and that personally met Yevgeny Prigozhin, the former head of the Wagner PMC. It wasn't a surprise that an overwhelming number of you voted in favor of it. So in this interview discussion that we recorded two to three weeks ago, you will discover his perspective of the war in Ukraine, what the Russian youth thinks of the situation, and how Grisha decided to play a part in all this. Are you ready? Let's go! Z, 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 это Z, это победа, это V, своих, блядь, не бросаем! Welcome, everyone. Today we have a very special guest, Grisha Putin. I think you all know him. I did a poll a couple weeks ago on my Instagram, and the results were over 90%. Yes, interview him. So, Grisha, welcome on History Legends. Um, hello everyone, I'm really honored to be here because I, I, I watch your videos and uh, I think we have uh, we have same uh, passion for Napoleonic history, so mm -hmm. I am also a fan of that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, you, re you reached out and we met. We have to thank Caleb because it all started because I watched Caleb's video when he went to Russia and then he met you. And that's where it all started. So then we got into contact and uh, I'm glad. So thank you, Caleb. <laughs> yes, thanks, Britannica. So everyone, I don't know if you know him, but we'll trace back to where it all started with Grisha and where he's at now in his life. He's 17, everyone. So first of all, how do you handle all this attention as a 17-year-old? Oh, I'm pretty fine. I just uh, started ignoring school, kind of, for the last uh, two to three years. I just... Oh. It's just so boring, and uh, I decided that I'm going to make my way through through the digital stuff because mm. it's my passion. I love it, and uh, I mean, I found the right way, I think. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Uh, maybe it's a dream for people to, mm -hmm. to, to do like this, so I'm not... I don't want to lose it. So let's go back two years ago when you were 15, military operation starts. So can you tell us a bit more about February 2022 and how you started everything as a streamer for Hearts of Iron 4? I mean, as a streamer, I started, um, it all started with, obviously, I got hosted by a guy called uh, Tommy K. He is now heavily pro-Ukrainian. Uh, he donates money for them and stuff like that. But uh, in a way, I got to thank him because he was the one who discovered me first. Um, mm -hmm. I was very good at a game called uh, Hearts of Iron 4. It's a strategy game about World War II. I was uh, one of the best players there. I uh, even earned some money through tournaments. My the, the cool thing about me was that I knew how to play well, and uh, mm -hmm. I was able to dress up. I'm, I'm just going to show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Place. I don't know. For example, if I played as friends, I obviously oh, had nice. the, the nice, gold nice. hat. I have... Uh, Where did you find all this? I mean, this one was made in Pakistan. I bought it on <laughs> eBay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
but I have all sorts of flags for uh, countries and uh, uniforms. So it, it's my passion. I would say I'm a LARPer in that sense. And uh, mm. well, people people liked me, and uh, I started everything on English, uh, despite me being Russian, simply right. because um, there was not really an audience on the Russian market for this. So mm. why not mm -hmm. go international? Of course. Do you have a German uh, Stahlhelm? Do you have a German? Oh, of course I got it. Uh, not only do I have uh, a Stahlhelm. Uh, oh, yeah, Stalhelm, Stalhelm, I don't, it's a, uh, I have a German, uh, <laughs> German MP40. Okay, starting, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have a Mauser C96, I okay. store my money in a, German grenade. Oh, uh, I. <laughs> These are all from Pakistan too, right? Props from Pakistan. Um, well, they're replicas, but they're not from Pakistan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I've got quite a collection of all kind of uh, collectibles for World War right. Two, and that's my passion. And uh, then, so you became very good at Hearts of Iron 4, and you became very famous when you started playing the Ukraine war on uh, a mod in that game, right? Oh, uh, I mean, I was relatively famous because uh, before that. <laughs> it's just uh, on 24th of February, I woke up 8 a.m. I had school obviously on that day and mm -hmm. I was like, bro, stuff is happening. I got to boot up my stream. I went live. People started joining. I started broadcasting uh, Russian uh, news uh, mm. because, I mean, we have different uh, so, sort of news flow. And uh, after that, uh, obviously, like around half of my... Uh, Half my following turned uh, back on me because oh. they told me I'm fascist, uh, Russist, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Uh, Pro-Ukrainians started telling me that I should change my nickname from Grisha Putin to Grisha Zelensky to show solidarity with Ukraine. I said, like, well, what the fuck are you yapping about? Um, mm -hmm. And after that, uh, I thought it's, it's my kind of mission to show... Uh, people from other countries, how it is in Russia from the mm -hmm. first hand source. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it up to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about that game that that went famous, you know, that uh, uh, Z, Z, when was that recorded? Uh, that was uh, summer 2022, oh, I think. Okay uh i mean yeah it was it's so so strange right now i mean two years have passed since the know, start of special know, operation I and it's, it's... i had i had evolved so much uh, from the guy who just played games to then mm -hmm. guy who played uh, games about military conflicts playing irl to a guy who is helping soldiers uh of that conflict uh in real time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how did you go from streaming Hearts of Iron 4 to Wagner, Prigozhin? Mm, I, there was a moment in which I kind of fell out for around uh, six months. This was in, two, in late 2022. I just, uh, I, obviously I was uh, uh, not invited to any games with anyone because mm. like everyone thought he's pro-Russian, stuff like that. Um, and uh, I struggled. I didn't understand where should my place be? Do I try to go back to gaming or mm. I find something new? And I thought, why? Why? I mean, I'm a good gamer. Why not combine it with the current political situation? And uh, it was the start of 2023 when the PMC mm. Wagner Center opened in St. Petersburg. It was like a couple of weeks after its um, opening. I just came to the reception desk. I told them 
may I please see the head of PR department or something like that? Uh, she got to me, we sat down, I told her I'm a patriotic uh, YouTuber, I do stuff mm -hmm. like this. Could I please uh, stream here? They told me, sure, they, they ran a security check on me and like one month in, I was, I was there, I was uh, playing and it went viral very viral i mean i would have never thought that there is going to be like newspaper articles about me playing uh hearts of iron 4. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, you gotta admit it's, it's uh, pretty unique so you played in the the, the wagner headquarters I wouldn't exactly say it's Wagner headquarters. It's PMC Wagner Center uh, because okay, headquarters okay. of Wagner are in a different yeah, yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. Yeah, well, PMC Wagner Center as it is. So, how often did you go to that place? Like every day or every now and then? Uh, every now and then, really. I only made around uh, six to seven streams there. I played oh, okay, even okay. Arma Free. Like I, uh, I could have done anything I wanted, but I stuck to my theme. Um, I actually played, uh, it was, I mean, it was bizarre. I mean, I'm inviting people from like uh, NATO countries to play as NATO countries in Hoi 4, while I'm in PMC Wagner Center playing as Russia. And this is, what? Yeah. Well, I just, I just rolled with it because, yeah. well, life gives you a chance, go, go to the fullest. And um, the thing, uh, that that has been defining my success is that I always say yes to opportunity. I cling on to that opportunity. Uh, that's uh, that's why I succeeded. I'd say as as much uh, as I did. And by going to to that uh, PMC uh, center, how did you end up meeting Prigozhin? Um. I it's actually it's actually not about PMC Wagner Center itself, but rather there was a bar that was hosting uh, lectures by uh, famous people of the war, and there mm -hmm. was a uh, one evening with a military correspondent uh, Vladimir Tatarsky, mm -hmm. on which mm -hmm. I came uh, to with my mother. It was on second of April, and a uh, terrorist bombing occurred uh, on that mm -hmm. day. So you were I there in that place. I was very lucky to leave 30 minutes before the bombing itself, but my mother was oh. there. Everything is fine with her. Um, so all of this happened. Then two days passed. Prigozhin visits the place of the bombing. And well, I came there with my mother to kind of su support her. And mm -hmm. this is how I got um, this. Uh, I'll show it on screen. I'll show it on screen. Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. So yeah, how, I, how did it feel like to, to meet him? It's, I mean, he's a character that has defined uh, history that will be in the history books. I feel like, I mean, his role is uh, immense in this conflict. Uh, he was very chill respectful it's not like i talk to him or anything i just okay. uh, i i made a handshake with him and uh, mm -hmm. we proceeded the the thing is i made a photo with him on my birthday and uh, because of that the pmc wagner center staff because i kind of missed on my birthday they made me a pmc wagner cake uh, that I ate in the PMC Wagner Center. I'll send you a picture. Well, yeah, it, it was a wild ride. What uh, do you think of the, the PMC in general? So their military actions and the relationship with the Russian government? Um, I'd say PMC Wagner is a very unique and a very effective uh, structure. It's obviously something that Russia needs. Uh, an uh, organization that is able, well, that's capable of being on multiple continents, uh, doing stuff in uh, Russia's uh, interests. And uh, Prigozhin was just the guy to organize all of this. And um, I mean, they 
they got Bakhmut, they did the they they took a role on the on themselves and they uh, completed it uh, what, whatever methods they used they got the job done and that's so in a way without them the, the war in ukraine would not have been the same without their participation most definitely would not be the same um okay. i probably to the worse if not for them i would say so okay okay and what from your perspective what was the relationship between the the supposed problems between Wagner and uh, the government like was it real what was it about um obviously there was uh, tensions between uh, Prigozhin and uh, Shaigu on on a personal level too because uh, this whole thing dates not to the special military operation you got to go way back to Syria and uh, study the relationship between Wagner and the Ministry of Defense forces there mm, and I'd say you you'll get a you'll get a picture of how it all went down uh, don't want to go into details but it's a long history as uh, the whole Ukraine Russia conflict is because uh, it seems like a lot of people uh, especially in the start only dived into it on the very surface they didn't know that there was like 2014 and there was Donbass and the Russian Spring and stuff like that well same here history dates a while back okay 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 very very interesting uh, I didn't know about the situation in the conflict that started in in Syria can you say a couple more words about it um I think it was about the um, um when the um, anti uh when they were promised uh anti-air support in Syria but uh, it wasn't provided and it resulted in uh mm. deaths of uh Wagner fighters ah I see I see I see I see uh okay okay interesting <laughs> now, I mean I'm telling you what I yeah yeah yeah. I'm... yeah 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 I I'm I'm just thinking about what event but uh I might have an, an idea of when that could have happened mm, I think and... you probably got the right idea there they were not many events <laughs> yeah yeah okay all right so then now you you met okay I thought you actually had more interactions with Prigozhin but it was that <laughs> picture right okay um I actually had the chance to meet him one more time when I was celebrating my birthday he was uh, I was like on the fourth floor and he was on the first floor giving a speech mm. um I mean I don't really have much else business with him if yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would I would have loved to have any kind of game uh made about uh, well Wagner itself but mm. uh, I asked about it and uh, they were not exactly interested which is very strange because uh, from my perspective Wagner has always been the organization that's been uh, one step forward in mm. uh, all kind mm -hmm. of uh, innovative stuff and I'd say propaganda through games is the next step that for example USA mm. has been using a lot especially with like uh, Call of Duty and stuff when the right, enemies right, are always right. uh, either are, um, with big black beards or uh, with a heavy Russian accent so yeah yeah, yeah 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 draw your own conclusions yeah right right so yeah it's how do you question about that how do you see the future of propaganda gaming for example in the world um it's gonna be heavily invested in and whoever is gonna be the first to capitalize on it is gonna get the, the most out of it which is currently USA mm -hmm. but propag propaganda shouldn't be that blatant because for example uh Call of Duty Modern Warfare uh, I think it was the two phone one of the recent versions uh in which uh, an event uh well which happened in real life the the road of death when the well you know mm. when the American uh, Air Force uh, 
bombed the um, highway out of Baghdad uh, with the fleeing uh, military personnel and civilians. In that game, it's depicted as if the Russians are bombing it. So they are literally re reversing the roles. I mean, there is only one road, Tariq al Mut, the highway of death. The Russians bombed it during the invasion, killing the people trying to escape. And uh, I'd say that historical education has been degrading. I mean, education in general. And they yeah. also talked about the Syrian uh, civil war and uh, things like I mean, that. Yeah, they're just changing the place and the names a little bit, but you get the general picture and that they are pointing like those are the bad guys, despite right, 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 they are right. the ones committing the crime uh, in in real life. Right, right. That's and, uh, actually, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, I'm currently working on a project uh, in Africa mm, that's gonna gonna be interesting. It's gonna be in a couple of months uh, from now. It should be picked up by the foreign media, especially since, you know, there is a lot of stuff happening in Sahel region. With, uh, oh, yeah, can't say too much, just saying that. No spoilers, I, no spoilers. Uh, I am still in the magazine of a gun. That's what I like uh, when I have. Well, that, that means I have a job. So, yeah, I am. Okay, I am uh, mode. if you can say one thing about this this thing you're preparing with Africa. It's going to be about games. It's going to be about games and about uh, education, about propaganda. I mean, in general, uh, kind of everything uh, we, all the messages we convey are propaganda. It Propaganda isn't uh, exactly something in a negative form. It's just, well, you're propagating your thing. I mean, propaganda of healthy lifestyle that's like against McDonald's stuff like that so yeah. I think recently it's been uh, used uh, too much as something negative though I mean usually it usually let's be honest we know it, it's negative because essentially you only show one perspective of of a, of a situation that's why people say it's negative but from your perspective it's not as if you're trying to be unbiased. Let's be honest. You you have a chosen a side, and you you're pushing the narrative of that side. Mm, maybe you're correct, but I see propaganda as just a way to convey your message. Yeah, just, uh, as a, I, ter just a terminology. It's just recently yeah. it became. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. I understand. So, do I mean, you, for uh, you, it's. Yeah, for you, it's a big topic because you're the guy who has to see through the lies of propaganda all the time on your channel, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's why <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> to see both, both sides of the perspective every time. I'm like, this guy says this, this guy says that. And you have to look through the, the fog. You have to look through what everyone says. So that's why. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's why people watch you so much. And that's why thank you've you, been able you. to stay on top because you are... Uh, I'm throwing flowers at me on my channel i mean you am i i'm not dishonest so we'll, we'll ask the people in the comment section <laughs> 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 but okay okay one thing I, I wanted to ask you i i put a note i see you have a, a flag in the background and i saw that we we talked a bit on private i saw on your telegram there's a lot of flags and you're very interested in history so question number one during that German TV interview, you said you like the German Kriegsmarine flag. Why? What interests you in this flag? Where comes the, the interest? I mean, it's just in general, I'm a big f flag guy. Currently in my room, I have a Serbian, Soviet, Imperial, Wagner, and Russian flag. Uh, I just like flags. I like history. I'm, I'm a LARPer. That's, I'm just honest. I have around uh, 40 or 30 flags laying uh, in, uh, in, in behind me. Uh, and the Kriegsmarine one is just the most, I'd say probably the most beautiful German flag I know. So I, I just wanted to show the Germans that, you know, I, I know their stuff and they try, <laughs> try to twist me like I'm a bad guy yeah. or something. Uh, I, I see, I see. Yeah, during that, let's talk two seconds about that in interview. So apparently they, they said stuff about you that 
that you never said. The, I think the biggest WTF moment was when they said, you don't know your father. And they just continued like this as if it was normal. Well, why did they say this? Like I... they, they, they assumed a lot of things about you being paid by, by this. And, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, actually, yeah. I think we can address this. I was not paid by Wagner to do gaming streams mm. out of PMC Wagner Center. Uh, it was purely my initiative. Um, the thing about the father, I never mentioned it to them, nor mm -hmm. during the interview, nor in the talk between us. Maybe it's just a way of like mainstream media because I mean, they're like the second biggest TV channel in Germany. They had to say something to put me in the bad light because because I'm mm -hmm. on the the other side, uh, right. though, I mean, yeah, right, right, right. I knew my father. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but now that that's a question I wanted to ask you on the on the the front in Ukraine on the Russian side, we see a lot of different flags being used, and I see a lot of people in my comment section they ask about it. So, for example, the the Russian soldiers use a lot the Soviet World War II flags, the victory banner of 1945. We see it often. We see the Russian imperial flag very often. And side by side, we also see the, the red flag with Jesus in the middle, the, the flag of Ivan the Terrible from the siege of Kazan. So how, how do you make sense of all this history for a foreigner? Because for a foreigner, these, this is completely different ideologies mixed up so how do you how could you explain this? Uh, it's the, the thing is there is no uh, ideology in Russia and it's prohibited by the state to have an ideology. So people uh, when people come to the special military operation, they are creating well, they're creating a purpose for themselves and uh, well, that's the ideology they choose and I mean you can see, like uh, there is a very famous uh, photo of uh, two self-propelled um, star artillery. I'll send it to you later. One has mm -hmm. a Soviet flag, the other has an imperial flag. I mean, those are like the, the polar opposites, literally, exactly. though they fight in the same direction. It's um, we had found a way to live in peace uh, with our history, uh, which is uh, hard to understand for the Western people, I suppose, because in your countries currently there seems to be a demonization of your past. I mean, when I remember exactly the Black Lives Matter protests in England, they were like graffitiing on the Churchill's monument, something like slavery or like gen genocide, something like that. And it happens in USA too. And uh, uh, probably in Canada, Canada too. Some? Yeah, yeah. They 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 tagged the the first prime minister of Canada. They took off the statue, and the city said, after two years, we're not going to replace the statue. The renaming streets and uh, you know, like main squares. So, in the the West, it's yeah, you're right. It's uh, yeah, it's like uh, cancellation of the past. Even though I mean, Churchill, despite all of his flaws, he was the one to lead the nation through the toughest period and emerge victorious in the end. Um, finding peace with your past is probably very important and I feel like Russia Russia has been able to do it. I hope Western countries may succeed in it because it's gonna... Well, if you can't live uh, peacefully with your past, how are you gonna move uh, into the future? Very, uh, very true. I mean, I did a lot of videos talking about that topic, about the, the woke ideology that that essentially that does that in the West, that they try to uh, demonize stuff that happened a long time ago and bring it back uh, on today's topic. And I think the, the German journalist that came to you, it's the same thing. They tried to demonize you for showing something about their past. You and it's been over a hundred years, but <laughs> clearly it hasn't been long enough. Uh, it will never be long enough for them if they can use something as an argument against you. Let's be honest. Um, yeah, I just, I, I talk a lot, obviously, with uh, people from foreign countries. And uh, it is a problem with, it's not 
only that they bring it as an argument, they are replacing the narrative, they are changing the historical figures to be like black and stuff. I mean, what the, f- uh, like literally, you you don't see that kind of stuff in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish all people from, well, Western countries or other parts of the globe find peace with your history and that's going to pave your way into the future. Yeah, that that uh, th- thank you for this explanation because we saw so many signs and flags on the Russian side. People were, were saying, "What is what is it all about?" But, In a way, uh, it's because everyone is united by a common enemy. Mm, that that also counts uh, because mm-hmm. when when there is a such a dangerous threat, I mean that you have to take up arms and uh, go fight. Well, uh, you kind of forget everything uh, that happens inside the country, and you got to get rid of the foreign uh, aggressor, foreign threat, so to say. So it's uh, in a way both sides, Ukrainians and Russians, they're LARPing too about World War Two. I feel there's a because the the Ukrainians have these uh, crosses on their tanks. Okay, it's very similar to the Cossack one. I understand it's apparently something from hundreds of years ago, but it's also very, very similar, guys, to the, the symbols that were used on Wehrmacht tanks going into all of Europe. So, And uh, there's also a couple brigades in uh, Ukraine, like the Mountain Brigade called Edelweiss, Edelweiss. which is the, the same as the German Mountain Brigade during World War II. So everybody's playing that LARPing game and the, the Russians are having the Soviet banners and reusing a lot of terminology. So I think it's interesting that both sides just uh, use that. I mean, it's it's kind of obvious because World War, I mean, World War II, Great Patriotic War for us is a very, very big thing in our history and it hadn't happened so long ago. I mean, I I met with veterans of the Great Patriotic War. That's how that's how little time has passed. And uh, when a Russian sees uh, German tanks coming at him, uh, I mean, there's just some kind of genetic memory that you're go- you're gonna have to blow this thing up just like your grand grandfather did. And no offense to Germans, but well. It's like Leo Leopard is coming at you with a Wehrmacht cross painted on it. Well, just is like it that. true and that then... Russian soldiers get uh, extra bonus when they they destroy such uh, vehicles? Yeah, they there is like a couple of singers and artists in Germany that pay off uh, bonuses. For, I mean, the, this is pretty widely used and uh, used for PR in a way, but it's also the government that gives you additional money so yeah it's in a way uh, we joke about it it's like uh, one abrams down one uh, one loan paid off uh, how much how flat. much for example <laughs> for an abrams like a couple of days ago that that's that was the talk i think it's a bit um one one to three millions it depends on the how much uh, uh, wait like... uh rubles to usd so one million ruble. So that's eleven thousand dollars. One million. Yeah. So you said between one and three million rubles. So they well, make between on... ten to thirty thousand USD. <laughs> like the entire unit or one guy? The entire unit. Um uh, one guy. One guy. What? Well, the guy who blew it up, I mean. Yeah, but sometimes it's more than one guy. Oh, well, then they probably split it uh, wow. and have a nice party. But, well, I mean, that's Fun a fact. The Soviets to... did the same thing during during World War II. They also had the system of... Uh, bonuses. Paying. <laughs> no, I, look it up. The, the Soviet army had bonuses for uh, teams that could destroy tanks, uh, anti-tank units that could destroy tanks. They, they had a system of bonuses that you could get and i mean you couldn't buy much with it but you could get money you know so that was a uh, pretty interesting the uh, well, same uh... and another <laughs> similarity and the, the thing is ukrainians uh well if we come back to larp they're larping is the nuts i mean th- those are the guys who lost and those are the guys who got judged by the whole world why are you 
LARPing them? Why are you painting their symbols only because they were uh, against Russia? Like that seems to be the only topic uh, why they want to be associated with the Nazis is because they fought against Russians and they forget everything else that the Germans did. And then they are wondering why are people so obsessed with like uh, the Nazi problem in Ukraine and stuff because you cannot ignore those Bandera monuments. You cannot ignore those uh, torch uh, marshes they did in Kiev. And uh, this is a, a thing that many Polish people can probably understand me on because uh, under, well, I mean, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists or ONB and ON with uh, Shuhevich, uh, those guys were responsible for like massacre in Volyn which took lives of Poles, Jews, and Russians. And uh, I think a lot of Polish people are split on the matter. Mm -hmm. Exactly because of that, because Ukrainian government doesn't do anything to stop glorifying of uh, Bandera and instead they even use it to promote war. And I mean, we have seen- I, I, do, I do think that, for example, the Azov Brigade, they, they still change the logo I still, I, I see there was a, an effort, especially because in the West, they, I mean, before the war in the West, they talked about it a lot. The war started, they, they stopped talking about it. And I think the Azov Brigade, they, they, kind of, they toned it down. At the same time, the, the thing is that in war, you need these guys, you know, these, uh, I compared them to, 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 it's like the Ukrainian Wagner Corps. So, the, the both sides they you need ideologically motivated guys like not in in the sense of ideology but in the sense of combat ready to to give up their life so you, you and you only find this ideology in certain sectors of society and that's my opinion every country has those every country has those uh i understand you but i'd say wagner is not a compression to azov if you want to make a compression to like highly ideological units, that's on the Russian side, Rusic. Uh, yeah. Wagner is, there was not such like a far right or uh, what, whatever ideology. There was a very key component of winning in any war and uh, being good as a unit. There was a brotherhood, battle, battlefield brotherhood being built between those people. They, that's why they were so effective. Uh, and uh, that's why Prigozhin, well, why he was so cherished, because he was able to do it. And uh, I would not draw a compression between Azov and Wagner. Those are... Did you watch the, the interviews of Prigozhin when he, people asked him about uh, when the war guns all? asked him about questions about ideology and he 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 said i don't care about ideology he said you can have whatever ideology as long as you fight so that was his answer because i think people uh, were questioning him yeah but i can tell you from my personal experience uh, from wagner fighters and the atmosphere they told me about i mean yeah, that, that's how it is. I wouldn't say they had a far right ideology. There was a brotherhood, yeah, which is above I ideology, understand. in my opinion. Talking about this, how did you live through the uh, the June March of Justice of Wagner? So, how did you interpret this? How did you live it? Uh, I kind of closed myself on the duration of those days um it was difficult painful i can't i'll say that i call it march of justice uh, for me it's not a mutiny or attempt to like overthrow the government or like a coup whatever it's march of justice um, i think this kind of says my position i i I'm very glad there was no bloodshed, uh, major bloodshed. Mm. We don't know how history would have turned out if there was a storm of Moscow. Like mm -hmm. I, I have no idea, but uh, I'll call it March of Justice. Mm -hmm. 
And how did you talk to uh, Wagnerian fighters that incorporated now the Russian armed forces? Are you still in contact with some of them or, or not? Oh, uh, I am. First of all, I'm 24 and 7 nowadays in contact with uh, um, with uh, Russian soldiers due to nature of my stuff, which I guess we can I can explain a little bit later. But it's it's a difficult relationship between uh, between those who went from Wagner into Ministry of Defense. There is a difference between them, but I mean, in the end, we'll fight for Russia, and that's the uniting factor. Um, we we mustn't go against each other. E, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was their main thing. That we all f were for the same cause, no brother bloodshed. And right, uh, right. I mean, in the end, they're all very valuable specialists that you not allowed to lose on especially in this time when warfare is going to be happening everywhere in the world and i mean mm -hmm. it is pretty much now let's talk about the uh, the next part of uh, your career so you're by the way so you're in high school i i wanted to ask you are you a star in your school because i saw you do presentations they show your videos at school i think i think everybody knows you like how is it like to be a student in that such a thing i really rarely go to school nowadays i work what? a lot oh ah well unlucky but i mean teachers are kind of fine i mean literally just today um i had uh, my good friend uh his call sign is pirate he is um He's an uh, ex uh, Spetsnaz uh, leader group and the uh, current uh, commander of one of the um, companies uh, that fights in Uglidar right now that I help with equipment. Uh, I mean, he he did a presentation to my class about like, well, he just told about life. They, they asked him questions. He said, I'm standing here before you only because of the help of, well, material help that I provided. So... I know that my the stuff that I do directly impact impacts people's lives, basically deciding whether they are going to live in that moment. Uh, well, the equipment I, I was uh, able to buy. So my mission is important and I, I don't just pass school to, you know, play games. I did this turn uh, for me into a very serious task of right. helping supplying so, gains. So now you're you're a streamer and you the the funds you get from from it or donations you uh you use it for military aid if I understand correctly. Uh basically seen in the summer of 2023 I created the uh, uh Z Shaker Central. <laughs> um it's a community of uh, pro-Russian foreigners. And basically, I started uh, making donation goals, like buy, buy a drone, buy uh, spare car parts, buy medkits, buy an armored vest, and stuff like that. And I did it with foreign audience almost exclusively. So, I mean, for example, I don't know, 10 medkits, could could be bought by some German guy who decided to help. Uh, though usually people that help me are from Eastern Germany. Oh, just just a funny historical thing. Um, so yeah, that's what I I've been doing uh, since then. And uh, I recently started uh, a new thing. Um, I make um, people make an order to me, and I draw their like picture. Like usually it's like an anime girl on an artillery shell i have uh, all these weebs all these weebs ah uh, well i mean they help so can can't say no though i mean there there are plenty of good warriors that watch how much animes. is it the same cost for every design no it's different but um i took a little bit of inspiration from the ukrainian project of similar nature that's been able oh, to make i didn't like know i didn't point... know that oh 
they made like 1.8 million dollars so far i i made like maybe about seven to eight k euros for that thing though i have only been doing it for like two months or so uh but i always aim high so you know mm. I, you got to have ambition if you want to achieve something but yeah like 30 euros to i don't know type hello 100 euros to have an anime girl and uh, i recently uh, also started working with a chinese audience so you got famous I'm, in china you told me like now you, you're a star there it's crazy i'm i feel like i'm more known in china than i am throughout all my career here and in china there is there is just a lot of people so you right, kind of get right. qu quicker to the fame um so yeah i'm just really all about finding uh, creative ways to solving problems and i mean there is a problem a unit is uh, in need of a drone I yes, I was going to ask you. So what type yeah. of equipment do they do they ask for? And why do they ask for equipment? Isn't it covered by the, the Russian armed forces? So that was the question I, I was going to ask you. Uh, well, for example, I'm helping a unit that uh, in the past was part of the Donetsk People's Republic militia, which was a complete. Well, it, it was a thing for, for a very long time since 2014, their unit. Mm -hmm. And it's been recently incorporated into Ministry of Defense, so the supply routes mm -hmm. aren't exactly established. And um, stuff like Mavic drones, uh, for example, mm -hmm. it cannot be, well, it's not really supplied by the Ministry of Defense. So, mm -hmm. because so I mean, every unit have drone. to buy their own Mavic drones. Usually, there, there are oh. some replacements, but Mavic is just a very universal thing Mavic 3, Mavic 3T. Mm -hmm. uh, bombs oh well grenades recon all types of uh, stuff i actually if we're talking about mavics i'll just show you uh soldiers that i help they bring me uh, trophies so to say for example this is a jacket i'm currently well i have it some sort of uh, it's like uh, a lion i helped defeat I, well, that's how I call it. Um, it's a Ukrainian field army jacket. It was uh, taken in Robotino. You're insane, uh, bro. <laughs> You're insane. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's. Uh, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of trophies. Um, yeah. I have uh, <laughs> this. Wow. I mean, I'm I do know sure. that on, on the Ukrainian side, they, they sell the opposite as well. I, they have helmets and like a bunch of stuff. So well, I know this I is don't... a big industry right now to have a, the, the war trophy trophies business is big. Well, I'm not selling or buying. I keep them for a museum that I'm hosting in my school. So I'm just showing people stuff. For example, this is a down the Mavic 3. It still has a camera operational. Uh, you can even, I mean, there is uh, some science on it, like mm. uh, stuff they did. There is like crosses. A cross means successful hit. Uh, this was downed in Ugledar. I How have... do they down the drones? They, uh, shoot? they actually, they, the unit that I have, they actually have a Mossberg shotgun that they got from ukrainians and they use it to down drones oh i mean of course they have the <laughs> of course they have the radio electronic warfare stuff and mm -hmm. i mean you can use a lot of things against those drones for example this one was uh, supplied you can type it's in ukrainian uh it mm -hmm. was uh, supplied by one of the well other guys who collect aid for the front mm -hmm. uh and so i well this i got a very recent one this is a oh, ukrainian armored vest from ugledar it was uh, i'll just say the, the guy didn't exactly need it uh, um, well i mean i just trophies because well museum yeah um, for the museum mm, i mean i have some more uh, simple stuff like this is a mm -hmm. ukrainian combat veteran 
thing. It doesn't have any documents. It's in FSB. This is a Ukrainian National Guard uh, chevron picked from mm-hmm. Mariupol. Uh, I got some Russian stuff as well. Like uh, <laughs> this is a Z plush. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> a Z, a Z plush. Okay. I mean, why not? Um, I have yeah, a sure. medal for uh, one year of service. Uh, it's Is that an actual medal, medal they, they give? Oh, for the Sparta. That's an yeah. actual medal. Um, it was given to me by, by a combat veteran who is no longer able to serve. He just told me, keep it for museum. I trust you. And, uh, oh, <laughs> this was also recently picked up from Ugledar, from one of the Ukrainian soldiers. <laughs> what? Uh, I, I know that there is like a, a g- unit or something like that. It's It has like the unicorn uh, as their sign in Ukrainian military. There is like all the LGBT guys serve there. So, yeah, I kind of keep on trophies. I mean, it's just... Do you have helmets? Do you have helmets? Uh, Helmets only have... uh, Like, either Russian, whatever. I only have Airsoft that I use for Mm -hmm. cosplays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, there's still time, so... Right. So, (laughs) so, so before we... I asked you again. So, what are the the the, the most important things they they ask you? So, drones, uh, grenades. Uh... Uh, no, no, no grenades. Uh, Mavic free drones, uh, probably the most commonly used thing and the most universal thing you can give them because they're kind of expendables. And Ukrainians have more of drones than Russians. I literally had a word uh, today with them with a Russian officer that told me due to the shortage in manpower, Ukrainians are more and more relying on those uh, drones and launching them in, in mass. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Ukrainians sort of, especially in those civilian drones, they have, an, uh, they have a numerical advantage. But, I mean, it's how you use them. Mm. That's another story. Interesting. Mm. And uh, yeah. w- I know you in the post, hold on, uh, what... Uh... What uh, did they say? Oh, I, I think I I lost it. But uh, yeah, they okay. So it's mainly drones. And uh, do they need uh, flak jackets, food? Maybe I don't know what type of. Uh... Uh, nah, food. I mean, they got it all covered. Uh, uniform. They usually buy it by by themselves if there is any need. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's mostly drones and expensive stuff. Like it could be a car that they need mm, because again mm-hmm. supply routes aren't uh, established and so mm, many soviet mm. vehicles are there uh, and are being bought and maintained that there is a little shortage of like uh, spare parts because they are no longer produced and mm. so they have to buy well you know like toyota hilux or something like that <laughs> mm. uh, and you know the the roads in ukraine they're muddy as very muddy and it's very right fun. that's why i every time i see fundraisers on either side ukraine and russian it's literally drones and cars but now I understand why okay it's literally all no. they need that's mm-hmm. that's like the most ex- expensive things that the that you aren't really being provided in sufficient amount so yeah i just do as much as i can and uh in one of your posts you said that uh, you had uh, three hundred thousand uh, rubles at one point uh, donated to uh, to to the unit. I think three no three hundred thousand units is flowers. No 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 rubles in... rubles rubles three hundred thousand rubles. rubles. Yeah, yeah, that's not a lot. That's flowers. It's three thousand uh, dollars. Like three k euros. Uh, yeah, 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 that's yeah. small. In total, since uh, the summer of two thousand twenty three, I have collected. I think around 26,000 euros and that's like 28k dollars and I'd say that's pretty big for a and for all for that world. one unit or for multiple no, units No it's for different units I have oh, worked okay. with um, Spetsnaz unit from Crimea uh, I worked with artillerymen in Belgorod they all have different needs but I mean I I only ask them 
how much money and if you can record me a, a thanks video and the thing is absolute majority of those funds are uh, money from not russia it's like from china from uh, germany from usa i have mm -hmm. it's insane i have like tens of people in usa who had donated to me and um, for me it's been i, I have appeared on uh, russian media and for me it's always a message that i mean there is so much dehumanization happening uh, all the time in this in this war especially that um, i mean mm -hmm. there are for uh, there, there are people from other countries who support us and that there is there is a lot of them uh and uh, i'm not agitating for like nuclear annihilation i'm more like talking out people out of it because some people are very out of their mind sometimes when they say stuff like this they, they're mm -hmm. being driven crazy by propaganda and it's not just the the, the western side it's we, we have those on the russian side i'm not i'm not going to be biased or anything here and mm -hmm. uh, my main mission is just maintaining that uh, bridge of friendship between russians and uh, foreigners foreigners I think it's a noble goal that I'm going to stick to that uh, hopefully my profession in the future is going to be about because mm -hmm. I'm planning on going to university and uh, go for the international relations. I mean, that's what I've been doing since 14. So you don't I see think. yourself uh, uh, volunteering for the the war in Ukraine? No, I, I actually asked, well, I had a conversation with that Russian officer today. I asked him, do you think I should go? He said no. Uh, because for a single person to be fighting uh, in, in a war, there has got to be three other people at the, fro at the home uh, making equipment for him. And in a way, if uh, we would, for example, go back to, like, say, Great Patriotic War, 1941, when... Um, when teenagers well when when soviet teenagers were working on the factories doing uh, all sorts of armaments i am kind of doing the same just in a different setting of the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yeah i'm mm -hmm. not exactly the most fit guy for army i am i just i'm playing to my strengths right really. right right all right no, it, it's uh, it's fascinating to to learn the the, the your story because uh, people they 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 know you just your name but they don't actually have a, a conversation with you, right? So it's just it's interesting to see this uh, perspective. How did you choose these units? Did they come to you? You reached out to them. How did it work? Um. It was all, I, I literally got messaged, uh, ah, it's, it's pretty wild, but uh, back when I all started this, I didn't even think I could carry like 300 euros a month, uh, but at all, uh, but right now I'm able to handle like two to three to four to five K euros a month, depends on the month. And uh, I just got a girl uh, who DM'd me asking for help. She is uh, from Arhangelsk. She is a volunteer. Well, she is literally a volunteer. Like she drives stuff uh, from Arhangelsk to to the front line, to various uh, front lines. I mean, first of all, it's wild for me when women do heroics. And for me, the I don't know, just important maybe because I grew up. In, in a family of mostly like uh, females but it's it's crazy to me that she does all of that for free like she literally drives to the front in her car carrying all of this stuff she asked me for help i helped her once i helped her twice and then i just started working full time on her because when well money is always needed and well mm -hmm. she she's been providing me with contacts on who to support and I've been so far successfully satisfying the needs. Though, I mean, you can never really satisfy the need. You need as much as you can, but there is a minimum or a standard you got to have in your unit. And that's what I'm helping them with. So the the, the, the soldier you talked to recently, 
Um, he's, uh, I think I, I saw you, you mentioned him uh, earlier in a post. He's a uh, part of a Cossack unit, I think, or something. He said like, uh, yeah, it was, a uh, it was a unit that had Cossacks. I know. I think he himself, he's not Cossack. He's actually pagan. He's not uh, Orthodox. Uh, oh, he doesn't okay. have anything against other religions and stuff, but it's actually kind of common in war time. I mean, in civilian life, we usually don't see pagan and st stuff like this, but, uh, you know, it's kind of this masculine society that you live in, especially if you fight for a long time and not going to judge him, whatever. He is a great person. And I mean, he has been, he fought in 2014, 2015 uh, in Donbass. He participated in the Sy Syrian conflict and uh, he's been on SMO for like, for like a year and, uh, and a couple months and he's been fighting in that unit uh the battle axe um it's like a recon group co composed of um ex uh, special forces guys so mm -hmm. i mean they're like universal tools mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i mean that guy he he watches rick and morty <laughs> he watches anime on the <laughs> on the front back there when when he has well just uh, relax the head a little bit um, and he, he listens to Linkin Park uh, and though this guy has been fighting uh, for for so much of his life so mm -hmm. when you he's get 34 Park, right he's 34 right yeah I think he he is around that uh, he, he told me that once uh, this conflict is over he's like he's gonna go home he has a, he has a child he has a wife so uh, mm. He's not interested in like any in endeavors in, in uh, Middle East or Africa and stuff like that. It's personal mm. for him um, because of the stuff he saw in two thousand fourteen. Just for the reference, uh, do you know the when the Eider column was uh, burned by the Rusich? No. Okay. Well. Fine. Uh, I, it's pretty widely known in Russian community, but yeah, he's just. A wait, wait. So, so do you want to talk a, a little bit about it, or I'll just say he 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 witnessed it. He witnessed the results of the burning of that column. You can check it out. In what later. year? What year? What year? Uh that was 2014. Okay. Yeah. He he saw the results of that. How so? And I mean, he came on stream here to me. I'll just send you a picture. He was there. He was answering uh, questions from foreigners. Uh, he was wearing a Batman T-shirt while I was. Oh, wearing... I, I saw the promo. I saw the promo. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I was wearing Russian military fatigue, even though I'm I'm not from the military, and I'm like 17 year old, but I'm a larper. Okay, that's allowed. I I, I do my job, so mm -hmm. I can have my my nice things. Mm. Yeah, I'd say my transformation from a gamer to war war supplier, I don't know. Military aid. Military, Military aid. aid is crazy, but such is the world today. You mm -hmm. got to adapt. And I feel like I have an opportunity to have an impact in my country's history. And uh, I'm using it to the fullest because mm -hmm. uh, there is a great quote by Napoleon. Some men die in the shades of olive trees uh, and some die changing the world. Some ev even in their defeat, something like that. So I, for since childhood, for me, it's been uh, very important. I just have this in my mind to mm -hmm. be remembered like literally be remembered be in a history book mm -hmm. do something meaningful that you are going to be remembered uh, way uh, past your lifetime and that's been my goal i don't know if it's good or bad but for some reason it, it got stuck in my head and mm -hmm. well here i am it's a uh, it's uh honestly it's a fascinating journey and i, I don't think you it, 
even imagined two years ago what you would be doing now. So. <laughs> Life is uh, honestly in that year. I, I thought like, oh my god, I'm gonna go to the TwitchCon. I'm gonna meet so many streamers from other countries. But then they all like became pro Ukrainian. I became pro Russian, and were both um, one of the guys who I was kind of friends with is now supplying the Ukrainian army. I'm supplying the Russian army. Like what? Uh, um, you guys I, don't talk okay. anymore, right? You guys don't talk anymore, mm. right? Nah, that guy, he he said about me, like, I don't know that guy. He never did anything with me. Though I don't possess any hard feelings for him because mm -hmm. he helped me a lot. And he lives in Germany. I live in Russia. Maybe it's just the way the universe goes. Right, right. Uh, quick question. That uh, soldier you, you met a couple of days ago during that stream, what are some things he said about the front to during that stream if you just want to summarize it uh about the front i can tell you i told you about ugledar a little bit uh mm -hmm. ugledar is currently active defense phase uh kramatorsk slavyansk possible next axis of the offensive i don't know how well Let's... that matches with your oh well if you want to talk about this no but <laughs> i'm yeah, not good yeah, yeah. i just yeah. transcripted his words because well you see you seem interested you fired up a little bit uh, um so so you said uh kramatos uh, slavyansk uh yeah, donbass yeah um also i asked him I, I talked with him a couple of hours ago i asked him what do you want foreigners to hear because i mean he doesn't mm. really speak english uh and what what should be the main point i bring to foreigners he told me um for them to understand that the current war that's happening in Ukraine for the West it's for uh, commercial purposes and for Russians it's for personal and that's the difference of how it's perceived in both of our worlds so to say mm -hmm. so here I am mm -hmm. telling this mm -hmm. to you and it is true and especially uh, we come back to the Nazis and the Soviets uh, World War II literally so Grisha how how do you see yourself in the next six months one year I mean it's gonna be your birthday soon how do you see yourself come into the adult life I don't know when you graduate so what are the next plans in your life hello history legends uh, you asked me about my uh, future plans and projects um, I'm actually in Moscow right now uh, in the headquarters of the African Initiative. It's uh, an informational agency about Africa uh, in collaboration with which I'm working on a big project called uh, the Dawn of Africa. It's gonna be a modification for Hertz Fire and 4. I mean, that's my main game in which I spent 7.5k hours. Uh, and um, me and the team of uh, developers are uh, conducting a scenario uh, about uh, the future of uh, Africa, well, the foreseeable um, for the probably till 2025-2026, uh, while also um, giving sort of a history lesson on uh, what had uh, happened prior to 2024 so that uh, people can uh, learn about africa and um, foresee um, what's gonna happen in the future uh, i mean for me it's a very big project and uh, ho hopefully everything uh, works out I just wanted to, to make it uh, more unique by recording it uh, in Moscow. Uh, so yeah, by, back to the back to the main interview. Thank you. Um, uh, my dream, in a way, has been well, small dream, uh, creating a game similar to Call of Duty in style, but about Russian history. Uh, well, it's a minor goal. I just want to take part in it because 
no. Um, I don't know. I really like uh, video games and I wanna... I think games are a great tool to study history, especially mm-hmm. for the younger generation because uh, you got to speak... Uh, you speak. You go, you got to speak their language if you want to... Um, if you want to get them to, to know information. And especially with the way information flows nowadays, everything is digital, it's a must. Mm-hmm. If you want to... Mm-hmm. If you want your country to be strong, you got to take care of the younger generation. And, well, I think I'm kind of the guy for the job and I would love to push that policy. But, uh, yeah, I would love to connect, continue connecting uh, Russia with uh, foreigners. Um, it, whenever I say foreigners, it seems kind of offensive in my mind. I don't know. Uh, I have really grow, grown to like people from different countries because um, like half of my success is literally people from uh, won't say exact countries but from I have a guy from Scandinavia a guy from Benelux and the guy from America and they're all helping me um, and half of my success is my successful uh, team leading uh, because and it's important that you don't use people you elevate them to your position and you evolve with them. And that's kind of what I'm offering. And those people, they're not Russian, but they still help me. And that's what what's crazy. I have people, uh, I have a guy from uh, Eastern Europe who sends me 20% of his uh, wage for, uh, for the fundraisers and stuff. And he's not Russian. He just says like, bro, I don't know, fight, fight the fascists. That, that was his message when I asked him, why do you do this? Um, I have a guy from Chile who is like 15 or 14 years old. And uh, when I had a fundraiser for Mad Kids, he was like, he got his lunch money. It was like 20 or 30 euros. And he sent it. And he's like, yo, I, I got to do my small South American part. Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't have anything against people of Western countries. I... You know, just appreciate your history, um, learn from uh, its mistakes. So, like, no uh, or Napoleon invasion of Russia and m- mind your own stuff. Be a patriot of your own country. Because I'd, uh, if I would be a French patriot, I wouldn't think it's in my interest to send uh, money to one of the most corrupt countries in Europe send military equipment that's gonna be blown up uh for what for what exactly is france gonna be invaded is like france next on the list for uh, russian world of domination i the fear mongering propaganda is uh, very real in the west especially lately with Mm -hmm. um well you you know yourself um yeah for sure for sure yeah and uh, I'm pretty excited to see what you're you're gonna come up with. I think you have a a, a, a bright future ahead of you. That's uh, that's for sure. And uh, let's all hope that uh, the war ends uh, as soon as possible. I mean, that's. Uh... Uh, I mean, I wanted to end in the Russian victory. It's maybe a bad thing to say, but well, for the but I'm just being I'm, honest. I mean, you you. Uh, we we are, I think with the flag in the back, uh, it, uh, it was uh, expected. <laughs> well, mm, some people say uh, the war to end as quickly as possible, but the thing is, war could end tomorrow, and it's not going to be solved. It's going to be a frozen conflict, and then I don't know. Like my son is going to have to fight for this. Yeah, oh, but, uh, I uh, you. I think you're right. I think. Um... Uh, I, I actually said the same thing in an interview a couple of days ago, and uh, that's the thing. If the war stops now, nobody's happy, and this is bound to happen again in uh, X amount of time, just like 2014, 2015. So uh, in that regards, you're right. But at the same time, in my opinion, that's why everybody's throwing all their energy in this war now. All right. I mean, that's like literally history of our world no one wants to give an edge to the opponent i well mm-hmm. we're humans i don't know we love fighting and each other it seems there is we we cannot be fixed unless 
we evolve uh, our moral compass or whatever, but wars mm-hmm. have, have not been stopping. And uh, the... though I yeah, really I wish ahead. we don't go to war with Europe, NATO, we absolutely raise our kids in peace. They have a they have a choice uh, who to become, not to be sent to the front line. Uh, hopefully, just I hope for that. And the last question I have before we we wrap this up: How do people perceive the the war in uh, in Russia? So it. I'm going to develop a bit more. So are there people in Russia that live as if the war is not existing or is the war always present in your daily life as a, uh, as a they, regular people? They are 100% a lot of people who don't have the war touch their life, uh, okay. especially people that live far away from the front. Because, for example, recently in St. Petersburg, we had an Ukrainian drone. So mm. like kind of sets off a little bit of an alarm uh, when you see that stuff on the news and you're maybe, maybe those people wake up a little bit, but mm-hmm. unless your relative is there, a lot of people, they carry on with their usual lives and it's understandable because you cannot live in position of constant stress. Mm-hmm. I don't think um, that Ukraine, Russia, well, more like West versus Russia in Ukraine currently is the same as the Great Patriotic War because mm-hmm. Great Patriotic War, everyone was mobilized. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's, I think, current special military operation is exactly so that we don't get a Great Patriotic War because in the end we, we won the Great Patriotic War, but at what sacrifices? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting. So, on your, in your daily life, well, you as a teenager, uh, it's maybe hard to say, but in your daily life, you don't see much difference between since the, the war started in the, in everything. Mm, not one bit, really. Like we have all the stuff in the shops as we had. I mean, one brand might have changed their name, but we still mm. have it. We don't have shortage of like PC components and stuff like that. If you want to buy something, you go and buy it. There, there mm. is... Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. there, is, there has been developed ways to go around those sanctions. So mm-hmm. in the end, the profit will always find, well, capitalists will always find its profit. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially it counts for companies that told for the press that they're withdrawing from Russia, but in reality they stayed because uh, mm. the cost of getting back into Russia is going to be far larger than benefit mm. of like uh, from the press. But yeah, uh, life as usual, I mean, you see more military personnel a little bit on the streets um mm-hmm. yeah, do people life, thank life. them do people thank them uh the military personnel or they ignore them uh as much as i want to say that they thank them i have not seen it much myself i mean i have been confused for military personnel myself because i always wear uh, Russian uh, camouflage mm. jacket with a Z on it. People, people do come and like ha- sh- shake my hand, uh, shake my hand, and like say thank you for your service. Uh, when I had the Wagner patch, they did like jumbo. Uh, there is some stuff like that, but it's. I mean, I live in Saint Petersburg, which is considered mm. to me to be one of the most liberal cities of Russia. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, there is. Mm-hmm things like that so people do come up to military personnel but it's not like wide mm-hmm. widespread okay okay do you, is there anything you want to 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 mention talk about like as a conclusion to our our discussion is there anything i forgot uh, i'm just looking around my place um, yeah take your time take your time I have a Canadian flag. <laughs> no way. You have a Canadian of flag. It. Of course, because it's World War II. One of the... Yeah, true, true. Uh, but you have the World War II flag. Idea. You have the World War II version. Well, the with the leaf. Or you mean the Dominion. 
because the Canadian flag with the leaf is is new. It's like it um, dates, it's, it dates I don't think I have the Dominion. I don't think yeah, I yeah. have the Dominion itself. Um, I mean, really, I just wish people connect with each other more. Especially, I mean, we live in the digital age when you can, you're from Canada, I'm from Russia, even with our whole time differences, we were able to set up this conversation. People mm -hmm. talk with them, with each other more, understand each other, mm -hmm. and not all Germans are evil and want to kill you uh, because their government decided to send uh, tanks in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much for, for, I'm glad, for uh, listening uh, to the viewers. I, I once again, uh, thank you to, to Caleb for uh, indirectly making this happen. And uh, I, I, that's it. I saw your post on Twitter and then we connected and, and, and we talked. I, that's the beauty uh, so, of the internet. Yeah, yeah. It goes full circle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really do. I really do hope that... Uh, we meet at some point in life. I think it's nothing is impossible. I'll yeah, say from that... experience of my own life, uh, stuff changes in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. One day, if maybe... you ever come to Russia, for now, uh, I'm, uh, for now uh, I'm not planning on going I'm... on any of these countries. I'm not planning. Okay, okay. Well, I'm planning to go to North America at some point. So, oh, in life. When? Oh yeah, for sure, well, for sure. In life. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, well, I think uh, Americans and Russians are pretty similar in a lot of ways, but our government. How so? Okay, uh, you, you you cannot leave us hanging like this. How how do you think they're similar? Uh, I mean, first of all, we're both kind of federations. We're composed of uh, different, uh, not only just the, the the state system itself, but I mean, America itself has uh, many ethnicities that form the single one. And I mean, the Russian ethnicity is a little bit similar to this, especially nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, both USA and Russia have been uh, trying to tackle that uh, prize of being the superpower and mm -hmm. being a single dominant power. Uh, it's just we have always been positioned against each other by the politicians, almost always. Because, for example, um, Russia actually helped USA during the independence war, uh, well, uh, the, the civil war for independence. Uh, and our ties were in the relationship between just the American people and the Soviet people, I'd rather say, um, was very good up until the point when Roosevelt died, World War II ended, and everything got switched up to this... Cold War uh, propaganda. Mm. Like there is a, we have a chance of not being positioned against each other. We should strive for it. It's definitely possible to mm -hmm. learn to respect each other. That's and that's not only for Americans. In general, multipolar world, baby. <laughs> Beautiful conclusion. Thank you, Grisha. Um, I'll put on screen uh, places where people can uh, reach out to you. So you, all your social uh, media handles, your uh, star famous uh, Chinese channel. I'll put everything on screen and uh, hope uh, to talk to you soon.